This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you in part by The Strenuous Life. The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you put into action all the things we've been talking about, writing about on AOM for the past 12 years. We've done that in a few ways. First, we've got 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. We've got weekly challenges. We're going to put you outside of your comfort zone and accountability for your physical fitness, doing a good deed, thinking outside of yourself, as well as you'll be a part of a membership of like-minded individuals who are all pushing themselves to become better and more useful. Head over to strenuouslife.co. Find out more information, what's involved, what you get, and make sure you get your email on our waiting list so you'll be one of the first to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co. Hope to see you there. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. In the first year of his presidency, the press used Theodore Roosevelt's name in connection with the word strenuous over 10,000 times. He was known as the strenuous president, and with good reason. From his youth, T.R. had lived and preached a life of vigorous engagement and plenty of physical activity. Today on the show, Ryan Swanson, professor of sports history and the author of The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt, and the Making of the American Athlete, discusses not only how T.R. was shaped by what was called the strenuous age, but how he shaped shaped it in turn by promoting sports and participating in athletics himself. We began our discussion with what was going on during the late 19th century that got people interested in what was then called physical culture. We then turned to the beginning of Roosevelt's introduction to vigorous exercise as a boy and how he famously decided to make his body. We discussed TR's fitness routine when he went to Harvard and how he became a fan of football there, which led to him supporting the preservation of the sport as a president. We then discussed how TR lived the strenuous life while in the White House and thereby inspired the American public to live vigorously too. And then we take a fun look at what TR thought of the game of baseball, how he went to a health farm at the age of 58 to get back in fighting shape, and what kind of exercise and athletics TR would be into if he were alive today. After the show's over, check out our show notes at awim.is slash strenuous president. Ryan joins me now via clearcast.io. All right, Ryan Swanson, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Glad to be here. So you are a professor of history at the University of New Mexico, and you've got a book out called The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete. Let's start off talking about the culture Theodore Roosevelt grew up in, because I think that explains or helps explain why there was a rise in interest in athletics and society as a whole during his lifetime and why TR's idea of the strenuous life would resonate so much with the public. So what was happening in the late 19th century that helped birth an interest in what they called physical culture? Yeah, it's a really dynamic time. If you look at the late 19th century, early 20th century, it's a really dynamic time in in U.S. history. And, you know, it's tough to boil down. There's a lot of things going on. But if I were to kind of point to two things, I would point to the fact that industrial and urbanization are really kind of peaking in terms of their influence in, in American society. So, you know, translating those not too complicated words, but translating them nonetheless, I'm a professor after all, you know, more and more people are taking jobs working for somebody else. They're being employees of factories in many cases, rather than working on a piece of land with their family as, as you know, families had done for generations. So people are working in different ways. And then in terms of urbanization, um, it's at this point in American history, about the, you know, the turn of the 20th century, when more than half of the population now resides in cities. And these cities are fascinating places with lots going on, but they're also really dirty and crowded and dangerous. And, and so life has fundamentally changed for the way that Americans live. And so with all of that going on, there are benefits. You know, I don't know about you, when I think of technology, my mind tends to just kind of go towards positive, right? New technology means means a positive, generally speaking. But if we look at the technology of the 20th century, yes, things are mechanized and consumer goods are cheaper, but there's also a lot of negatives that come with that. You know, these dirty cities, these cramped living quarters, people have to live close to where they work, you know, because the automobile is still a couple genera- or a couple decades away from being widespread. So there's also during this time of industrialization and urbanization, kind of a rise in general sickness. People are going to the doctor and they don't have acute pain, but they go to the doctor and they're kind of confused about what's going on. You know, they'll report things like bloating or fatigue or loss of sexual desire or balding or kind of all of these kind of factors. And there's a general confusion. You know, people look around and think, wait, you have all this progress and all this change. Why is it then that myself and the people around me seem to be less healthy and less vibrant than they used to be. So there's kind of this just general concern about about these changes going on. And so sports become part of the way of addressing that. This idea that with all this change, maybe I'm losing some of the core activities 
and realities of, you know, in terms of what it means to actually be a fully functioning human. So rise in cities, rise in mechanization, rise in industrialization leads to this concern about health. And so those are some of the things that are going on here at the turn of the century um, as Roosevelt is both growing up and then moving towards the presidency. So there's a legitimate uptick of sickness and general feeling of malaise going on. But you also highlight that there were all these articles written during this time talking about the good old days when men were men back in 1800. And here we are in 1895. We're weak. We don't have what it takes anymore, which is funny because that's the same kind of thing you hear today that with the rise in technology and convenience, men aren't as manly or vigorous anymore. So was there a romanticism for the past going on that magnified the problem? I think so. Absolutely. We're seeing a combination or they're seeing a combination at that time of real issues arising, but also, yes, a really intense case of nostalgia for the way that life used to be. And the newspapers publish articles and magazines and pamphlets and speakers are going around the country talking about how, you know, this this nameless example from, let's say, the 1860s. The Civil War is over, and what do men do? They come back from fighting a war, which had been glorious in and of itself. It's oftentimes kind of portrayed. And then they're working the land, and they're working alongside their father, and they are, they're digging holes, and they're raising crops, and they're strong physically. And when their head hits the pillow at the end of the day, they sleep contentedly because they've been physically challenged, and they're living the way you're supposed to live. And so, yes, there's tons of these stories going around about how men are no longer men because they're not working the land the same way that they used to. They're not the same. um, They don't have the same power over their own lives is oftentimes the narrative too. You're working for somebody else now. We're all employees. And I think these are absolutely analogous to some of the things that you're hearing about society today and about men today. You know, the, the, the saying or the, the idea of toxic masculinity is being much discussed now. We didn't have that at the turn of the century, but there's more so this idea that there's tainted masculinity. What men used to be has been lost with all this so-called progress in technology. So all that's kind of creating this, this brew of angst and opportunity and desires for change. And in some of those responses, like the physical fitness world, uh, the physical culture world, was very similar to some of the things you see today in response to some of the concerns people have. Mm -hmm. So back in the 1890s, you saw the rise of these sanitariums where people would go and just spend time on a farm and be in nature and walk and hike and and do all these things. And it's similar to what you see today. People would go, you know, go outside and like, I'm going to, I'm going to be paleo uh, so I can get back to my roots. They, they were doing the same thing in 1895 too. Yeah. I mean, they are, to put it in our vernacular, they're all about the cleanse back then. I mean, yeah, we're going to go to a place that isn't polluted by the kind of toxins of the city. We're going to eat things that come from the land. There's even a, almost an anti-carb movement that goes on at this time. Let's get back to meats and vegetables. Yeah. Bam- Bantine. That's what they called it. Yeah. They called it Bantine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, it's it's very analogous. I mean, we, you know, if you do say the Whole30 or the Paleo diet today, in some ways you are echoing just what Roosevelt's, you know, time was doing it, you know, in the ways that they understood. The medicine was a little bit different, but there is this intense understanding that I am not functioning as well as I could and I need to change something and, and separating from the city and my job and getting back to nature and getting back to a simpler way of eating. All those things are very popular. Some of the things you read from the time of Roosevelt as this revolution is going on in athletics could absolutely be written today. The ideas are still, are still pretty similar. So there's some nostalgia going on, but people are also grappling with real mental and physical health problems that came along with urbanization and and industrialization. And part of the response to this is to get into physical culture, to exercise, to eat better, to go outside. And this is the world that Teddy Roosevelt came of age in was shaped by. But he himself also shaped this culture of physical vigorous activity that would become known as the strenuous life. And that's because he had a personal experience with the difference that pushing back against softness can make. So let's talk about the origin story of where his idea of the strenuous life came from, which is the story of how he turned his sickly, asthmatic boy body into a strenuous, vigorous machine. So tell us that story. Yeah, it's a great story. And Roosevelt loves to tell it. And I'm sure some of your listeners know it, but it bears repeating because it really shapes the way Roosevelt thinks about sports. So I'll give you kind of the the snapshot version, but Theodore Roosevelt is an amazing child in a number of ways. He's really smart. He reads a ton of books. He's got a real scientific mind. He's always categorizing things and looking for the Latin name of this animal or that animal. So he's very precocious, as you might expect from, you know, the man that he goes on to be. But his, his real Achilles heel from about age three until his early teen years is asthma, as you say. He has a terrible case of asthma. And I always kind of, you know, urge my students, for example, or other people to, to 
separate Roosevelt's experience with asthma from perhaps, you know, the kid that you knew back when you were in elementary school who, yes, had asthma, but had his inhaler, but had to maybe sit on the side during PE class. And I'm not minimizing that experience, but for Roosevelt, his asthma is this crisis. It's a tragedy that's taking place on a daily basis. And it it absolutely defines his childhood. So the family is not able to put him in school. He can't handle school because he's got these breathing attacks. They try all sorts of crazy remedies to get him cured. You know, they'll, they try bloodletting. They have a seven year old Roosevelt smoking cigars. The family will go out for rides in the, you know, January icy air to try to get his lungs to open. They have him do shock therapy. Unfortunately, uh, abuterol inhalers, which become, you know, a real step forward, aren't invented till the 1950s. So Roosevelt is just dealing with this asthma on a daily basis and it disconnects him from his friends. It really keeps him from living any sort of strenuous life as a child. So he's just a, you know, a boy with a brain who's a, you know, precocious thinker, but he can't, he can't act like most kids do. And so Roosevelt tells this story over and over as an adult, and he'll point to one kind of pivotal moment. So he struggles from, like I said, about age three until his early teen years with this terrible asthma. And then things kind of hit a, a crisis point. You know, this, this struggle that Roosevelt was, has, was having put a huge strain on the family. Basically, they're kind of revolving around Roosevelt and always trying to, you know, stop this next attack from happening. And so Roosevelt's father, when Roosevelt is about 13, calls him in for a talk and basically says, we're done. And I think it's kind of, you know, as a father, I certainly think about this. He basically says to Roosevelt, you've got to fix this problem on your own. And that doesn't strike me as being particularly fair, right? You know, fix your own asthma. But basically what Roosevelt's father says is he, he expresses his pride in his son. He says, you're smart. I'm proud of you. And he says, to paraphrase, you've got the mind, And and Roosevelt clearly does, but you've got to make your body. And so Roosevelt takes this challenge, and his sister is actually in the room too, so she'll tell versions of this story as well. He takes this challenge, he stops for a moment and thinks about it, and then according to to both of them, he kind of throws his head back and says, I will do it. I'll meet your challenge. I'll make my body. And so Roosevelt, from there going forward, really dedicates himself to physical culture and to exercise. And he does it in the way that you know, the best rich kid could. He has his father build him a kind of mini gymnasium in the home. And then he goes to work training under several professional boxers who are former champions. And something really amazing happens. Basically, Roosevelt's asthma goes away. Now, it never completely goes away. He'll struggle with it off and on throughout the rest of his life, but it ceases to be this kind of tragedy, this crisis in his life. It becomes more controllable. And Roosevelt understands this as you know, kind of a causal relationship. I exercised and I pushed myself, therefore I cured myself and my asthma has gone away. And I think, you know, in fairness, I would understand it the same way. You know, if I had some real big problem in my life and I set forth a dedicated plan to solve that problem and that problem went away, I would say, you know, that's that's what happened here. I did it. We know that it's pretty common now for kids to age out of the worst kind of effects of asthma as they hit their teen years. And that's probably what happens to Roosevelt. It's not this vigorous boxing. It's not this exercise which cures him. Now that helps, but it's not as simple as Roosevelt understands it to be. And so Roosevelt for the rest of his life though will understand this relationship to exist. Push yourself and you will develop. And he'll hold himself to this idea. And as you know, I think more significantly, he'll kind of hold the nation to the same idea. You know, if we are weak, we should push ourselves and we will get stronger. So it's a really, really fascinating story about Roosevelt And I think one other way to think about Roosevelt, the kind of asthmatic, sickly child, it's kind of the only version of up by your bootstraps that Roosevelt can tell about himself. He comes from a rich family with political connections. So he's not like Lincoln who can say, I'm a self-made man. The only way Roosevelt really can think of himself as a self-made man is in this context of athletics. And so uh, perhaps that's why he loves to tell people about how sickly he was as a child once he's kind of moved past it. No, yeah, that that story is great. I, I love that story. And I have been to his little home gym. I went to his house in New York. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. I mean, it's not huge, but you know, it's this little room sort of like off the, I think it was a porch or a patio. And they turn it into Indian clubs, medicine balls, and the parallel bars. And you can go see that stuff still there. Yeah, it's absolutely worth seeing. Yeah, I've been there as well. And I think it really, yeah, kind of shows you a physical manifestation of this challenge that Roosevelt undertook. And even as a boy, like, you know, he became known as this uh, president who had this just vigorous energy and did everything full bore. He did that as a boy. And you highlight in the book, you know, he was a meticulous record keeper. 
about his fitness. And you have a picture uh, from 1875 of like he was, he'd always measure himself, his chest, his waist, his biceps, and he just kept details about that or it, whether he beat his brother or not in running. Like even as a, a 13, 14 year old boy, uh, he was like a little 25 year old life hacker. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good way to put it. I mean, I think actually I really got I really got some kind of joy out of this story, that part of the story. It's kind of funny. Roosevelt is self-absorbed, as many teenagers are, right? And so, yeah, he's meticulously writing down, you know, the the measurements of his biceps and his chest. And am I getting stronger? But the best part is, yeah, the older brother competing against his younger brother or and his younger cousins. And when he wins, he writes it down in this kind of very fastidious official fashion. I don't know. Something about this just speaks to me as a middle child as like, you know, look what these older brothers do, you know? So yeah, he's a really, I mean, he's obviously an amazing intellect and mind. And so he's engaged when he engages in athletics, he does it in a really unique way, a really serious way to a certain extent and keeps all these records. And so yeah, that, that athletic diary that he keeps is a real treasure, I think. So he, in high school, he starts building his body. The asthma starts going away. He goes to college, goes to Harvard, which at the time was a hotbed for early sports in America. Nowadays, you don't really think of sports in Harvard, but then like that's where sports were happening. What was TR's athletic career like in college? And what was he like in college? Roosevelt, maybe as much as anything at, at Harvard, is a joiner. Uh, he joins every club that will take him. Uh, and you know, in our vernacular today, I'd say he's got a case of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Uh, and, and this makes sense given what he had experienced as a child where he's kind of cut off from opportunity. So he joins all these clubs. He goes in full bore, um, but he does it in a way which is really, it actually shows a, a lot of confidence. Um, he's not He's not afraid of being different. And so uh, there's some really great memories of him in the, in the gym at Harvard. Um, and what a unique looking character he was. Um, one guy remembers meeting Roosevelt for the first time, and he basically paints this picture of Roosevelt's over in the corner, and he's got these high red stockings on, which look really weird, and he's jumping rope, and then he's working in the parallel bars, and he's pushing himself like to the ridiculous point of exertion. Um, and so this gentleman talks about, you know, Roosevelt goes crazy, and, he, and he's out of breath, and he's basically collapsing, and he kind of falls down next to him and says, hey, I'm Roosevelt, who are you? You know, and introduces himself like that. So he's a real character, not afraid to be unique, not afraid to be different. But during his time at Harvard, continues to really push athletically. So Roosevelt will commit his freshman year to visiting the boxing gym five days a week, he says. You know, so he goes every afternoon, he pushes himself, he spars with, you know, any number of people he can get to compete against himself. And of course, he continues to keep notes. You know, I beat this person, I lost to this person, I did these things. So, um, you know, his experience at Harvard is he's finally at the point where he can compete. Uh, he's not a champion by any means. He's not a brilliant boxer. But for Roosevelt, the fact that he can be on a level playing field and he can go after athletics is a huge move forward. And he really embraces it. It becomes part of his, you know, part of his development there at Harvard. And, and he, he has ridiculously high standards for the kind of men that he wants to associate with. He talks about finding a couple of friends at Harvard who were willing to box and wrestle for a couple of hours until about one in the morning. And then he really liked them because then they were willing to let him read some Alfred Lord Tennyson to them for a couple of hours after that. I mean, so think about the standards here. He wants a guy who can wrestle and box and then listen to Tennyson and talk about it into the wee hours of the morning. And so he's just, he's just a unique guy who's curious and passionate and vigorous and joining everything he can get. And he's doing so at Harvard. As you said, Harvard is big time athletics at this point. You don't know, I don't know what you would think of as the biggest athletic schools today. I don't know, you know, Alabama, University of Texas, USC, OU. right? Uh, OU, sorry. Oh, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Oklahoma, yeah, right. That's right. Uh, Boomer Sooner. Um, yeah, right. So, I mean, we think of those as the big athletic schools. And, and as, as you said, we don't, we don't put Harvard in there, right? Because Harvard doesn't even have, offer athletic scholarships today. But during Roosevelt's era, as he's kind of experiencing all these athletic things really for the first time, he's at the big time athletic school. Harvard is the football school. They've got an amazing crew team. They win lots of baseball games. And so they are the OU of this time, you know, this kind of marquee athletic program. And Roosevelt, you know, just to be clear, Roosevelt is nowhere near good enough to play for any of the Harvard teams. But he goes to games and he goes to the boxing gym and then he writes for the Harvard Crimson about athletics. And so he's kind of in this real hotbed of athletics as as he's at Harvard during this, you know, 1876 to 1880. So it's a really interesting time in his life. 
The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you turn your intentions into actions. We've done that in a few ways. We first, we created a series of 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. There's hard skills like self-defense, wilderness survival, outdoor skills, soft skills like public speaking, social skills, personal finance, how to be a better husband, better father. We also provide accountability for you for your physical activity every day, doing a good deed so you're starting to think outside of yourself and thinking about something bigger. And then we also provide weekly challenges they are going to put you outside of your comfort zone physically, intellectually, socially. And besides, Besides the uh, weekly challenges and the, the daily check-ins and the badges, TSL Platform also provides a way for you to get together with other TSL members in your area so you can meet up in actual physical space and start doing stuff together. And the guys, the meetups are, it's a ground up thing. They're organizing it themselves. Some events are really simple just to get together for a ruck for an hour, but then other groups are planning these multi-day events where they're doing all sorts of stuff, camping outside and working on TSL stuff together. So it's a real community that's been formed here. If you'd like to get in our next enrollment, head over to strenuouslife.co. You can see everything that's involved with the Strenuous Life and then make sure you get your email on our waiting list. That'll help you be the first one to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, check it out and make sure to get your email on our waiting list. And I hope to see you in one of our next enrollments for the Strenuous Life life. Let's talk about football a bit, which back then was a much rougher, more violent sport than it is today. Uh, even though Roosevelt didn't play for the Harvard team, he's a big fan of the sport and remains a fan throughout his presidency. Absolutely. He's a fan of football, no doubt about it. Uh, he, he admires the game for a number of reasons. Uh, if you think about you know, kind of the Roosevelt picture I've been trying to to paint a little bit here. Roosevelt appreciates football as a tactical game. You know, he sees it as something, although we're talking, you know, about a cluster of people moving to organize, you know, a group of men to gain territory and to push the ball takes strategy and takes tactics. And so he really admires the game for that. He also admires it though on a much simpler level. He thinks it's good that the sport is violent. He thinks it's good that people get hurt and that you test yourself and that you learn how to deal with an injury. For Roosevelt, football is connected to war and to military. And so he sees that as a real positive. Not that he doesn't have concerns about the game, but he he's always a fan. He always enjoys it. And he always sees it as important as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of people at the time thought football would be a great, it's a great way to train young men for war later on if they have to go to war. Absolutely. I mean, You know, I'm not sure they articulated necessarily what they thought was coming out of it. But if you look at Roosevelt, for example, when he's raising the Rough Rider Regiment, you know, in in 1897, 1898, Roosevelt's able to kind of organize the kind of man that he wants to get for this regiment. And he basically seeks out two, two types of people. He seeks out people from the Southwest, you know, from New Mexico, we're tougher, I guess. You know, he says he wants people from this frontier region of the country at that time who are, you know, kind of making their own way. They're tough. They're kind of outside the normal system. And then the second category he's looking for are our college football players, college athletes. So Roosevelt sees them as ready for war because they know how to work as a unit, because they know how to suffer together. So he absolutely makes this military football connection, which is, as I know, as I know, you know, you know, still a connection which exists in our kind of general understanding of football today. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I played football, like there was like, you got the, like the war pep talk that your coach would give you, which pumps you up. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I get yeah. it. So TR was a fan, but there was this point when his presidency, like shortly after he became president, there was this crisis in football and college sports where people were about to like, we're going to get rid of football. Like presidents were like, we're tired of it. It's corrupting our students. People are dying. And then Teddy Roosevelt, as president of the United States, thought it'd be, well, no, this, I'm going to make this a priority as part of my agenda to save football. What did that look like? Yeah. So Roosevelt, I would make the argument, Roosevelt doesn't save football because no one person could save football. But as you're saying, he does play a really important role in the in the kind of moving forward of football. So to set the scene a little bit, um, you know, if you get to 1905, Roosevelt's just been reelected president. He's very popular. He's got a lot of kind of political capital to work with. And at the same time, in 1905, his oldest son, Ted Jr., is playing football at Harvard. So he's a football parent at that time, which I think is always important for Roosevelt. He sees the world, yes, as a president and yes, as an intellectual, but he also sees it very much as a father of kids who are playing sports. So in 1905, the violence that's always been part of football kind of climaxes, or probably the opposite since it's a bad thing. But uh, 1905, Depending who you ask, 18, 19, 20 young men die on the football field because of football injuries. And so at that time, the abolition movement that exists, uh, there's a movement very much arguing that football should go away. They've got, they've got all the kind of material that they need. So they seize on these injuries and really push to get rid of football, especially as connected to, to educational institutions. So the guy at the, 
really the forefront of this movement, ironically, is Charles Elliott, who's the president of Harvard. And Elliott has always disliked the violence of football. He thinks it takes away from the educational mission of the school. And so looking at all this, you know, the deaths that are happening, Elliott pushes for Harvard to get rid of football, which, in, which would be a huge injury to the sport as a whole. So I don't know who off the top of my head the president of Oklahoma is, but imagine if he came out and said, we're getting rid of football right? I can't, I can't really think of that happening, but uh, it would be a huge deal, right? Um, and so you've got, that's who's leading the abolition of football movement. And so because of that, uh, Roosevelt gets pulled into this debate over the where the game is going. And so Roosevelt's just won the Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, he's just been reelected. And so football is kind of put onto his plate, actually by the headmaster of the prep school that his kids are going to. He writes Roosevelt a letter and says, you know, the game is in danger. If somebody doesn't do something, it's going to go away. And that someone's got to be you, he says to the president. So Roosevelt does get involved. Basically, he decides in October of 1905, something has to be done. His own son has actually suffered a couple of injuries on the field as well. So he calls a meeting. And I always think this, you know, football is America's sport. So what, you know, as George Will said, it's got violence and meetings, right? So Roosevelt calls a meeting at the White House. He invites the basically the coach and administrator from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton to come to the White House for a football conference. And so, you know, just imagine this scene. You know, you've got football coaches in the White House sitting across the table from the president. The Secretary of State attends this meeting as well. And for two hours, these men debate kind of back and forth over what should be done about football. And Roosevelt says at the forefront, you know, he's pro football. He wants football to survive, but he also wants there to be some changes made. And this meeting goes on for a couple of hours. Unfortunately, there's no transcript. There's a lot of newspaper reporting from the day after saying, here's what we've heard happens, but we don't know exactly what happens. But after this two hour meeting is over, Roosevelt has to go back to work. And he basically tells the, you know, these, these leaders of football, I need a statement right away that's going to point towards change. What's interesting about the story in some ways is Walter Camp, who's the leader of football at Harvard, or excuse me, at Yale, I'm a really influential football kind of founding father. He, he'd had a bad attitude the whole meeting. He doesn't think Roosevelt should be involved. And Camp kind of leads this group as they're going home on the train to draft a really kind of toothless statement saying that they met with the president. They all agree football should survive. And the path forward is simply to make sure that the rules that are in place are followed. And as I say in the book, I suppose it's possible that this group could have done less in response to the president, but I can't see how, you know, they, they basically do the bare, bare minimum. But with that said, that's why I think it's tough to say Roosevelt saved football. With that said, Roosevelt, you know, had done some important things. He you know, invited these coaches to the White House. He gave the game another stamp of his approval. You know, people already knew he was a fan. And what happens after Roosevelt's, you know, meeting with these leaders is a series of additional meetings are held, which will lead to the establishment of the NCAA uh, in 1906. And so football is saved for the time being, and, and Roosevelt's a part of that process. All right, so as president, Roosevelt helps support athletics by lending his support to football, but he really helps popularize this idea of the strenuous life in general back when he was governor of New York with the speech he gave in 1899, in which he coined the phrase, the strenuous life. And this stuck and inspired his fellow citizens. And, and TR didn't just talk about the strenuous life. He really lived it himself. In the White House, he continued to box until he injured an eye. Then he took up judo. And he famously built, or his wife famously built, a tennis court outside of his office where he hosted the tennis cabinet. So who was a part of the tennis cabinet? And besides playing tennis, did they do anything else strenuous together? Yeah, the tennis cabinet is a group of about 35 mostly D.C. insiders, to put it in kind of a broad term. These are people who held positions in the government or the civil service, and they were around Roosevelt. And so this is a group that gathers together to play tennis, as, you, as you'd assume from the name, and they become really important unofficial advisors to Roosevelt. So when you think about the tennis court, as you said, um, just to give some some context to it. Roosevelt comes into the White House in 1901 and the place is in terrible repair. And so Roosevelt oversees a massive renovation of the White House. About $600,000 is granted from Congress to do this. A lot of important improvements are made, but right outside the executive office, I'm talking like three or four feet from where Roosevelt sits and works is a tennis court. And there's some debate over who put it there, as, as you hinted at. There's a, a 
you know, a pretty good case to be made that Edith, Roosevelt's wife, who oversaw the grounds kind of renovation, had put it there in order to encourage her husband, who always battles with his weight, to play tennis. And so that's that's kind of why the court is there. So this, you know, this group develops of unofficial advisors who are always willing to come and play with Roosevelt. Three of them become the most important uh, kind of to Roosevelt. James Garfield, the son of the former president who works in the government, he kind of comes and plays. Gifford Pinchot, who is, who's the director of forestry, a really important conservation voice. And then Jules Jusseron, who's the ambassador from France. And these are individuals who will come for example, on a January day when it's raw and cold in Washington, D.C., and Roosevelt wants some exercise. So they'll come and play tennis, or they'll toss around the medicine ball, or, or as you know, is kind of part of the book as well, they'll head off for a strenuous walk through Rock Creek Park, and they will ford rivers and climb up, uh, climb up granite cliffs, and all the while talk about what's going on. And so I think in some ways, these are both informal yet important kind of meetings. Roosevelt very much works through ideas as he is exercising. His whole life, basically, he's been trying to kind of combine mind and body. And so the tennis cabinet is is really a way that he does that. And the tennis court itself becomes a kind of cultural touchstone. You know, the idea, look at the president. He's got a tennis court right outside of his office. It's super hot in August, but he's still out there sweating through a three-set match. Why aren't you getting out of your office? Or why aren't you getting out of the factory and doing the same thing? So it kind of goes back again to this kind of broader understanding of athletics. So yeah, did Teddy Roosevelt's vigorous lifestyle, did that have an influence on the American public? Did like people look at him and be like, I'm going to exercise just like Mr. President is? I think so. I think so. I mean, you know, in some ways, tracking down the answer to a question like that is difficult. But what we do know is the press over and over tells stories of of the president exercising, which means that there's obviously an appetite for these kind of stories. So they will talk about Roosevelt playing tennis. They'll they'll capture the idea of him going for a long walk, a vigorous walk. For example, on the the night that Roosevelt of his 49th birthday, he goes for a three hour walk in the rain, and the press tries to give him space, but they also report on the fact that look at this guy. He's turned 49 years old, and he just went for a 10 mile walk in the cold rain of October. So yeah, absolutely. I think the president's example makes exercise in athletics something more personal for many Americans. And he's probably the first president that actually exercised, like in a, in a sort of systematic way. I can't imagine Garfield <laughs> exercise, you know, doing exercises or McKinley. It was probably Roosevelt was the guy that set, who started this whole thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there were presidents before him certainly who did physical labor even, you know, they'd get out and kind of work on the uh, on the grounds or they, you know, when they went away from the White House, they would chop wood, they do those kind of things. But yeah, Roosevelt playing sports or going for these, you know, kind of trail runs, this is something new. You know, and as I point out in the first year of his presidency, more than 10,000 times in the press, Roosevelt is described using the strenuous life kind of moniker, the strenuous president, he's a strenuous walker, strenuous eater. So yeah, this the idea that Roosevelt is something new and exciting is absolutely part of the the kind of appeal at this time. Let's talk about uh, another American sport that has a connection with Roosevelt, and that's baseball. So Roosevelt loved loved football, was a fan, not so much with baseball. Tell us a story there. <laughs> yeah, that's putting it nicely. Not so much with baseball. So Roosevelt never likes baseball. In the book, I I trying to kind of summarize what's going on. I, I say that Roosevelt has a cold war with baseball. So baseball at this time is very popular. It's by far the most popular professional sport in the United States. And Roosevelt comes into the White House, as I said, 1901. And during the time that Roosevelt is in the White House, from 1901 until 1909, baseball uh, attendance at professional games doubles. So the game is really popular. Also during that time in 1903, the first World Series happens. So baseball is booming. Despite that, though, Roosevelt will not give it the time of day. And, uh, you know, I, I found it kind of funny, but over the period from 1904, 1905, 1906 into 1907, professional baseball leaders make increasingly desperate attempts to get Roosevelt's attention. Because what they're noticing at this point is Roosevelt is strongly associated with you know, strenuous activity in sports. They also know that the president is really popular. You know, he wins re-election in 1904 on, you know, by a landslide. And they also notice he's, he just 
you know, he talks about boxing, wrestling, football, uh, these long walks, he does, but he never mentions baseball. So what baseball leaders do is they come to the White House to visit the president. And Roosevelt's always interested in interesting people. He lets all kinds of guests, you know, visit him. And so, for example, in 1905, the leader of the American League, Ban Johnson, comes to the White House and hand delivers to Roosevelt a golden ticket. And this golden ticket gives Roosevelt entry to any game in the American League, especially, you know, the hometown Washington Senators. He can come for free at any time. He can bring as many people as he wants. Gold ticket. Roosevelt thanks Johnson for the ticket and then promptly never uses it. And then the same thing happens the next year. The leader of what will become baseball's minor leagues comes to the White House, gives Roosevelt a golden ticket, says you can come to any minor league game in any state for the rest of your life. We'd love to have you. Roosevelt, you know, accepts the golden ticket and never uses it. And after this happens, you know, increasingly baseball friendly writers in the press kind of ask, what's the deal with Roosevelt? Why won't he give the game attention? And it becomes a rather awkward standoff, but Roosevelt digs in his heels. Uh, he will not attend a baseball game. He does not care about the World Series, which is starting. And it's really unusual given how much he talks about and writes about sports otherwise. And I do speculate best I can about why Roosevelt won't give baseball the time of day. And there are a couple of reasons, which we don't have any kind of silver bullet explaining exactly what's going on. But Roosevelt doesn't like that it's professional. You know, he sees that as a problem. But I think more practically than that, Roosevelt doesn't see baseball as fitting his paradigm of what a sport should be. It's not violent, first of all. It's not like football. It doesn't teach men those skills. And then it's also not kind of physically fatiguing. You know, it's not the same as going for a 10 mile hike or playing five sets of tennis. You know, you don't sweat a lot as a baseball player and it doesn't make you better in those ways. So Roosevelt just ignores the game throughout his whole life. And his daughter, Alice, will say at one point that father and us, she says, all hated baseball because it was too molly coddle. And you probably know that word or have <laughs> right, heard that word. Yeah. It's basically, you know, it's not manly enough kind of thing. It's a wussy game, according to Roosevelt. It's a wussy game. Well, but, and, but, so, but there's been some comeuppance in baseball since then. You point out, mm -hmm. so there's the, uh, the Nationals. They have that race with the presidents, right? Like sort of like the bobblehead president looking guy. Right. Roosevelt, right. Roosevelt's never won the race, ever. <laughs> well, actually, so for a long time, the Nationals. So yes, uh, I point out that the Washington Nationals, for those people who aren't familiar with this, and why would you be unless you lived in D.C.? Um, it, you know, fourth inning, they have a president's bobblehead race. You know, these huge headed mascots race around the Nationals field, uh, you know, to kind of keep the fans entertained during the mid inning change. The same as I think they have like sausages run around in Milwaukee and, you know, whatever else in other places. And for 525 straight games, Roosevelt was not allowed to win the race. And it became a real thing in D.C. And they did kind of a mock documentary and they had a call for Roosevelt to win. And I argued that, you know, whether the Nationals knew it or not, this was really great historical comeuppance. But to kind of bring it around, the Nationals did let him win. And in fact, this season, he has won the season kind of championship among mascot races. And so if you're paying, you know, for those of your listeners paying attention to baseball right now, you'll note the Nationals are in the World Series. So perhaps Roosevelt is being totally forgiven by the baseball gods and the Nationals will win the World Series. We'll know, I suppose, by the time this airs. But yeah, it's been a, you know, the mascot race and the LetTeddyWin.com community is kind of an interesting and fun way to think about Roosevelt's legacy in sports that, that still endures. So all throughout his presidency, Roosevelt stayed active. When he left office, he was very active. You didn't talk about these parts in, in detail about his life, but he went on a safari in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, then he went, did the, the River of Doubt thing where he almost died and explored an uncharted part of the Amazon River. Yeah. But then the part you highlight, sort of his sort of this continuation of the strenuous life after his office, is sort of like the end of his life where he goes to this farm to get in shape. Tell us about that and why do you, you focus on that part of Roosevelt's strenuous life? Yeah. You know, it, to be honest, it's my favorite part of the book, my favorite part of the story, at least in terms of how it resonated for me. So as you said, uh, Roosevelt leaves the White House, you know, 1909. He's only 50 years old. He has plenty of adventures after, you know, um, the River of Doubt. He runs for election again in 1912. He does a lot of things. He gets shot. He gets shot, he gets yeah, shot. and then gives his speech, right? right? Uh, so, I mean, he, he's hardly living some ordinary sedentary life. But I, I would argue that, you know, by the time 1917 rolls around, Roosevelt looks around and, and worries, as I probably many of us do, that the world is passing us by. You know, he's getting towards his late 50s. He tries to get Woodrow Wilson to let him be a part of World War I. It's kind of a delusional 
I don't know, maybe noble, but certainly delusional, you know, idea that I'm going to kind of get a modernized Rough Riders and we're going to go over there and teach the Germans a thing or two. Wilson doesn't go for it, of course. You know, you're not going to send an old president over to this world war that's going on. So with all that going on, in 1917, in October, Roosevelt decides to go off to training camp. And so, you know, really at the urging of his wife, too. As I mentioned, Roosevelt battles with his weight his whole life. You know, he's really active, he's really vigorous, but he eats like a teenager, basically, his whole life. You know, as much as he wants, whatever he wants, whenever he wants. So he's always trying to burn off the calories, but the math doesn't quite work out uh, in terms of how that plays out. So 1917, he goes off to Jack Cooper's Health Farm, it's called, in Connecticut. And it's a place dedicated towards, kind of like we were talking about at the beginning, the idea of healing yourself from the ills of modern society. And so individuals would show up and get this former boxing champion, Jack Cooper, to train them for a couple of weeks. So in my mind, this is the best part of Roosevelt's athletic journey because it's so relatable. It's so... I don't know, intriguing, maybe even inspiring in certain ways. So he gets there, he's 58 years old, he's about 30 pounds overweight, former president, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, all these things. He turns himself over to Jack Cooper and basically says, give me your worst, I'm ready. You know, I want to get back in shape. And so Jack Cooper, for two weeks, works with Roosevelt and just puts him through the grinder. You know, he gets him up at 545 to run three or four miles. Then he puts him in the gym for some sparring. Then he puts him, you know, gives him the medicine ball workout. And then in between all these things, he has him kind of try some of the inventions, the, uh, the exercise inventions he's got. So, you know, he'll put him in a, you know, in a bicycle, which is cloaked in leather, which has a heater inside of it to try to get him to, to kind of sweat some of his weight off. And then he'll have him massaged and then he'll take a cold shower and then he'll repeat the whole process over. And so for two weeks, Roosevelt goes through this. And what I think it shows is that at 58, with all of these things behind him and 30 pounds overweight, Roosevelt is still trying to live the strenuous life. He's still getting after it, which I think is pretty interesting. And on the last day of his time at, at Jack Cooper's farm, you know, he lets the press in. Roosevelt still loves the attention. You know, he's, he's not above kind of talking to reporters um, to his own glory. He lets the press in and he also allows, or also, you know, someone who comes is John Mitchell, who's the mayor of New York City. And so all these people are around and Roosevelt's talking about the two weeks that he has. And he says, I've lost 14 pounds and everybody's impressed. And this is as World War II is ramping up and the nation still cares so much about Roosevelt that this is front page news. And what's funny, I think, kind of to wrap things up is Roosevelt wants to show them the half mile loop that he's been running every day to try to get back in shape. And so he says, kind of come with me, I'll show you what I've been doing. And so he heads off around this half mile loop around a pond. And in typical Roosevelt fashion, he turns it into a race, kind of starts slowly jogging and everybody gets spread out behind him. John Mitchell, who thought he was there for this easy cameo, you know, to get some votes, ends up dropping out. And a half mile later, Roosevelt comes across, you know, what would be the finish line if it was actually a real race. And he's kind of victorious. And the press all gathers around him and talks about how vigorous he is. And Roosevelt, for one last time, gets to kind of expound upon how the strenuous life is a constant struggle. Always get after it. Always try to get it. And so, yeah, this is why I end uh, with Roosevelt here, because this comes, you know, shortly before his death. He passes away at 60. But I think Roosevelt was always kind of going after this strenuous life. So this this story, which hasn't been much covered, I think was a good way to kind of round things out as his life is is nearing its end. Well, you know, your book's called Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete. Like, what do you, after spending all this time with Roosevelt and his interaction with this sort of cultural movement in America, like, what lasting legacy does he have? Like, would, would sports be what it is today without Roosevelt or did Roosevelt sort of supercharge things? I would say, yeah. I mean, you're, I think both of those characterize it. Sports would not be what it is today without Roosevelt, at least slightly. I mean, he's, he plays a role. He's not the only part of the story. But I think I, I like your idea, and I, I kind of use the reference to like a super collider this time, you know, or he supercharges sports. So what I think Roosevelt does is at a pivotal moment in American history, he helps Americans understand how sports can play a role in making them better individually and collectively. And Roosevelt supports things like sports in schools. He supports college football. He kind of buys into the paradigm of sports that's being put in place, which still basically exists today, by the way. So I think Roosevelt's fingerprints are still all over our society as a whole and especially athletically. And so I think, I think the connection is, is, is an important and valid one for us to understand. So let's do some, some armchair psychology speculation. All right. You spent a lot of time with Teddy Roosevelt. 
I'm curious. We live in like a, I would say like a second strenuous age. We have all this stuff, CrossFit, powerlifting, jujitsu, MMA, rucking, obstacle races. If Teddy Roosevelt was alive today, which, which activities do you think, which strenuous 21st century activities do you think you take part in? <laughs> Boy, that's a good question. You know, so Roosevelt is, is in some ways he's trying to balance, right? He's always looking for something that appeals to his kind of intellectual side, his curious side, but is also challenging. I think Roosevelt would be in favor of, for example, CrossFit. I think he would love the idea of broad participation. Everybody can get in and do it, but at a different level. And we all go for the extreme, you know, whether you start at kind of position zero or position 70, the point is to get as far away from your beginning point as possible. So I think he'd like, I think he'd like CrossFit. Another thing I, you know, kind of modern manifestation of this strenuous life that he'd like, I think he'd like some of the endurance, you know, 50K endurance races across really difficult terrain, you know, or, or like even the mud runs that exist now, you know, get out and get muddy and go over the obstacles and compete in that way. I think he would like those kinds of things as well. He was never... Roosevelt was never about being the champion. You know, he famously said of himself, I never was a champion, but people can learn from my examples of kind of how to be an athlete anyway. So he would favor broad participation, extreme kind of sports events. And one thing, you know, kind of one key characteristic of Roosevelt in sports is he was never afraid to look stupid. You know, he would try anything. He didn't care if he got dirty. He didn't care if he wasn't very good. It was about effort. And so those would be the kinds of things that he would like. I think more as opposed to, you know, MMA, which, you know, maybe he would participate on on some level, but, uh, you know, I think it would be more towards CrossFit or, you know, one of these extreme endurance runs or something like that. But it's fun to speculate, I think, for sure. Right. Well, speaking of that, sort of those endurance events, Roosevelt, I think, has, plays like a direct role in that. So mm-hmm. I think when he, was, when he was president, he came with this idea that all officers in all branches in the military should be able to march 50 miles Mm-hmm. Uh, in a total of 20 hours. And then like I, it, it kind of got forgotten. And then JFK, when he was president, resurrected it. And I think our, uh, Bobby Kennedy decided he's going to try to do this 50-mile uh, walk in his loafers. And it was like wintertime. <laughs> and he did yeah. it. And then now, then after that, you sort of saw this movement of people like in like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they would do these 50-mile endurance walks. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so. All because of Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think he absolutely kind of sets that example of, you know, it's not always the high profile, it's it's the struggle. And so an endurance race or an endurance walk is an example of this struggle. You know, it may not be this acute pain that you have at one moment. There may not be this glorious, but can you stay at it for five or six or seven hours? Can you get through this river or this mud? So yeah, I think there's a, a real connection to Roosevelt because if Roosevelt as president gives it value, it allowed it to become more acceptable in society and more sought after. And so I think that's, yeah, absolutely important. Well, Ryan, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Yeah, the book's being sold at all places books are being sold, so they can find it there. In terms of where you can see some of the other writing that I've done, both popular and, and otherwise, my website is ryanswanson21.com. So ryanswanson21.com. And so I've got articles and, and things posted there that I'd love for people to check out. Fantastic. Well, Ryan Swanson, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. My guest today was Ryan Swanson. He is the author of the book, The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete. It's available on amazon.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash strenuous president. We can find links to resources where we can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Check out our website at artofmanliness.com where you can find our podcast archives as well as thousands of articles we've written over the year about physical fitness, how to be a better husband, better father. And speaking of The Strenuous Life, check out our online membership program called The Strenuous Life, inspired by Teddy Roosevelt's idea of The Strenuous Life. It's an online membership platform where we help you put into action all the things we've been writing about and talking about on the Art of Manliness website and podcast for the past 10 years. We've got badges based around 50 different skills. There's hard skills like self-defense, wilderness survival. We have also have a Teddy Roosevelt Rough Rider badge where you do some things inspired by Teddy Roosevelt like swimming in rivers, taking long hikes, things like that. We also hold you accountable for your physical fitness, doing a good deed, thinking outside of yourself, and we provide weekly challenges that are going to put you outside of your comfort zone. So check it out, strenuouslife.co. Our next enrollment is in January 2020, so get your email on our waiting list so you can be one of the first to know when enrollment opens up in January 2020. So check it out, strenuouslife.co. One more time, strenuouslife.co. I hope to see you and signed up in part of the Strenuous Life in January. 
And if you'd like to enjoy ad-free episodes of the AOM Podcast, you can do so on Stitcher Premium. Head over to stitcherpremium.com, sign up, use code MANLESS to get a free month trial. Once you're signed up, you can download the Stitcher app in Android or iOS and start enjoying ad-free episodes of the AOM Podcast. And if you haven't done so already, I'd appreciate if you take one minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. It helps out a lot. And if you've done that already, thank you. Please consider sharing the show with a friend or family member who you think would get something out of it. As always, thank you for the continued support. And until next time, this is Brett McKay. Remind you not only listen to the AWIN podcast, but put what you've heard into action.